All right, everybody, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, first off, welcome to today's presentation. Um, in the presentation today, we are going to be covering some of the changes coming to the process of importing into Canada. Uh, we are going to have a specific emphasis on the Canadian Customs Bond, since that is more so uh, what we are dealing with here at TRG. Um, something to keep in mind uh, throughout this presentation is that things in this whole process are changing. Um, the changes are currently underway. So new announcements are still being published and are subject to change. My name is Meredith Lambert. I will be your host and one of the presenters for today's webinar. I am the marketing manager here at TRG, Trade Risk Guarantee, uh, which translates into being responsible for researching and creating the educational content for all of you, as well as making it available. Also joining me today is Travis Smith. He is the national sales manager here at Trade Risk Guarantee. And with over 10 years of experience helping importers get their bonds in place, he is currently helping Canadian importers navigate the new waters of the Canadian Customs Bond. And really quick about Trade Risk Guarantee. Many of you are repeat attendees, but we do have a lot of new people out there in the crowd also. Uh, TRG has been in business since 1991. We're located in beautiful, snowy, cold, windy Bozeman, Montana. We operate on a direct to importer business model. We service the entire international trade community. If you ship five times a year or 5,000, it's important to team with an insurance agency that can go in depth on topics like ink firms or customs compliance, especially bonds. TRG is available for customs bonds, cargo insurance, or any other line of insurance you may need. If you have an off the wall question about international trade and wanna bounce it off somebody beside your customs broker or freight forwarder, pick up the phone and give us a call. Uh, next slide, Meredith. All right, thank you, Travis. Um, so just so you all know, we will be recording this webinar today and it will be available on YouTube for future reference. If you want to be notified the moment it releases, I highly recommend you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also post additional educational videos on YouTube about once a month. So if you are not already, please go and subscribe there. Uh, you can find us by searching trade risk guarantee hyphen TRG in YouTube itself. Um, a link to subscribe will be sent out after the webinar in our follow-up email. So as a reminder as well, uh, please submit your questions in the question box in the webinar interface throughout the presentation. We will be answering as many of them as we can at the end. However, if, if you have any questions during the presentation um, and they, you know, we're not able to get to them or, um, you know, we don't have time or we're just really not sure of the answer yet, we will reach out and try to answer those questions after. Um, I'm just seeing a question come in now about the sound. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, if you cannot, I do recommend calling in, you can dial in, but anyway, sorry. So uh, I'll take care of that in a second, but please uh, let us know if you have any questions. Don't hesitate to submit those in the question interface. Now, as a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. All right, so today's presentation is going to cover three primary topics. What is a customs bond, or sorry, what is a Canadian customs bond? How to calculate your bond amount and when to place your bond for Canadian customs. So without further ado, let's dive into answering the most encompassing question. What is a Canadian customs bond? Well, before we can really talk about what it is, we need to know what to call it. And throughout the process of researching this bond, you may notice that there are many different names currently used to reference this bond. So let's go over a few of those. Uh, first off, we have the tried and true Canadian customs bond. This term is kind of the most colloquial one used in conversation and online when referring to this bond. There are actually multiple bond types that you could call a Canadian customs bond, much like how there are multiple bond types that can be encompassed in the phrase US customs bond. However, 
we know that when most people use the term U.S. Customs Bond, they are actually referring to the, the Activity Code 1 importer bond. As we move forward, the term Canadian Customs Bond will be used as a kind of a shorthand to refer to this bond. The next one you may hear is Canadian D120 bond. In actuality, the D120 bond, or sorry, the D120 is a reference to the form that is used to secure the Canadian Customs Bond. This form is also used when placing other bond types with Canadian Customs. Now the next term is release of goods bond. This is the more official name for this bond. Um, in fact, when, when you are filling out that D120 form, this is what you would put in the input for bond type on that D120 form. <clears throat> and then final, finally, um, you may have come across or you may have heard the term surety bond for Canadian customs. This is a term we have run into from other service providers. Uh, for example, a lot of importers um, have said that um, FedEx or UPS has, um, um, if they, sorry, if they use FedEx or UPS to clear their goods, they've been told by those providers to secure a surety bond for Canadian customs. This is really just a long way of referring to this same bond, since it is a bond you would get from a surety or from a surety agency, which we will go over further in this presentation. So now throughout the presentation, we may use a variety of these terms, but we mostly try to stick to Canadian Customs Bond and Release of Goods Bond. So if you hear those terms, we're referring to all the same thing pretty much. Okay, so now we know what to call it, but why do you need one? So to answer that, we do need to go over just a brief introduction to CARM. CARM stands for CB. SA Assessment and Revenue Management, and CBSA means Canada Border Service Services Agency, for any of you that are not as familiar with that acronym. Now, CARM is a multi-year initiative with the goal of upgrading and modernizing the current import process for Canada. The focus is on creating a digital interface that provides importers with access to their trade information and account balances direct payment solutions, and trade tools that simplify the importing process. This will allow CBSA to better track and analyze import and export data and ensure compliance. So while CARM aims to simplify the importing process for Canadian importers, it, is, uh, it also has the added benefit of allowing CBSA to dig into the data of importing and exporting. Therefore, we will most likely see an increase in security when it comes to identifying trends and potentially dangerous shipments. So is participation in CARM mandatory? The short answer is absolutely yes it is. Um, a big part of the rollout of CARM is the creation of the CARM client portal. This portal has launched, uh, or sorry, was launched in spring of 2021 and importers are already able to register on the CCP. However, registration must be completed by release two, which is in spring 2022, in order to ensure no interruption to your importing processes. And every Canadian importer must register and access the CCP in order to be eligible to import into Canada. Essentially, if your business is not registered through CCP, it does not exist in the eyes of the CBSA. As of now, we do not have an exact date for release two, um, but we do know that it will be in spring of 2022. So no exact date has been named, but spring 2022 has kind of been, you know, what they've been saying now for quite a while. So obviously that is coming up quick. So now looping back to why you need a Canadian customs bond. Well, another one of the biggest changes coming with CARM, release two at least, um, is that each individual importer will now be required to secure and post their own import bond. Now, prior to this, importers were able to use the import bond secured by their customs broker. This will no longer be the case. With CARM, CBSA is moving toward a customer-focused relationship meaning that the importer will have a more direct role and a more direct relationship with CBSA. The release of CARM is 
honestly, it's very reminiscent of the changes uh, U.S. <clears throat> Customs and Border Protection went through in the 90s with the Modernization Act of 1993. This act is what initiated the endeavor to create the automated commercial environment, also known as ACE. ACE has taken many years to roll out and it is still kind of considered in progress by many U.S. importers, but the goal of having a centralized hub for import and export data is very similar. The way the bond ultimately works is also very similar to the U.S. Customs Bond. A Canadian customs bond is a financial security that importers and customs brokers place in order to secure the duties and taxes owed to CBSA. This bond is backed by a surety and it acts as a financial security that the principal on the bond will pay money owed to CBSA. So if you are familiar with how a U.S. customs bond works, it is very similar in this regard. The bond is a three-party contract between the surety that backs the bond, the importer that is the principal on the bond, and Canada Border Services Agency, also known as CBSA. Uh, the bond is in place to guarantee that the money owed to CBSA is paid, so it protects that revenue stream for Canada. It is not in place to protect the goods imported or the importer. Now, in the case of the Canadian Customs Bond, an importer will be required to have a bond on file in order to participate in the release prior to payment privilege, for shorthand called RPP. There's a lot of acronyms we're talking about today. The RPP privilege, just to go over that a little bit, um, the RPP privilege allows importers and customs brokers to have posted security with CBSA uh, to obtain release of their goods with deferred accounting and payment privileges. Participation in the RPP privilege is pretty much standard practice since it allows imported goods to move through the clearance process faster and much more smoothly. Benefits of participating include obtaining the release of goods from CBSA before paying duties and taxes, deferring accounting for goods, and deferring the payment of those duties and taxes. In its most simple explanation, um, it allows importers to clear their goods quickly and then ensure payment and paperwork is in order. So this is why it's very standard practice for this to be done. It, it you know, the way it's worded on a lot of these things makes it kind of seem like, you know, this um this option that you have, and and it is, um, but honestly, it's an option that it just makes sense to take. Um, but that's just a little bit about the RPP. We are not gonna go over that too much. We're gonna kind of switch back to the bond here. Uh, now, a very big concern uh, for importers with the requirement of needing to secure their own bond is how the liability of importing will be transferred. Well, this is also very similar to how liability falls when importing into the US. Since the importer will now be the principal on the bond, they will be liable for any claims on that bond. Now, there are a few things we deal with on the U.S. Customs Bond side of things that we are not quite sure how they will be handled for a Canadian Customs Bond quite yet. One of those subjects is how claims will be handled when they arise. Now, as we all know, when a claim arises, the bond principal is held liable for any additional money owed. However, how will this be enforced for the Canadian Customs Bond? What kind of claims will arise and what kind of timeline will there be now that the importer is more involved? For most importers, this may never really be an issue as they may never have a claim arise. I mean, that is the goal, right? To not have any claims. Uh, but we like to think about these topics and kind of think them over so that if they arise, when they arise, hopefully they can be dealt with since, you know, if a claim arises, it, it can potentially be a very big deal for a lot of importers. Now, another subject um, that you know we're a little, we don't have all the answers on quite yet um, is that of bond sufficiency. This topic has been a big one in the U.S. customs bond world <clears throat> as of late. So TRG is has very intimate knowledge of how this is handled and what importers should do to protect themselves. However, for the Canadian customs bond, there are a lot of unknowns. For example, how will notification be received when a bond is deemed insufficient by CBSA? How long will the importer have to remedy the situation? And will their importing be affected during that process? 
These are questions we hope to have answers to soon, but it is important to keep in mind that CBSA is going from a system that had been working with about 250 to 300 customs brokers and service providers, and they are transitioning to working directly with about 200, or sorry, 250,000 to 300,000 importers. There will be bumps along the way. Okay, so now let's move on to how to calculate the bond amount for your Canadian customs bond. The formula for this bond is not too complicated on the surface. Basically, the bond size must be 50% or more of the highest monthly accounts payable to CBSA within the most recent 12-month period. The minimum bond amount currently is $25,000 and the maximum is $10 million. Importers without a 12-month history will need to estimate the, the amount of duties and taxes they expect to pay in order to determine their bond size. Now, while CBSA will have input, input in your bond amount once they go to approve it, it is ultimately up to the importer themselves to determine the appropriate bond size. And this is why forecasting your accounts payable will be important to avoid sufficiency issues. Uh, this is a little visual aid we have put together to illustrate how um, to determine your bond size. Basically, you need to look back over the past 12 months and total up how much you have paid to CBSA within each of those months. Once you have identified the month with the highest total, you take 50% of that total, and that is the required bond amount. Now, let's look over a couple pretty simple examples really quickly. If an importer's highest monthly accounts payable is calculated to be $100,000, they will need to post a bond for 50% of that amount, which would be $50,000. Now, if an importer's highest monthly accounts payable is determined to be $30,000, they would end up needing to post a bond for the minimum amount of $25,000. Since 50% of $30,000 is $15,000, and that would need to be rounded up to that minimum. Now keep in mind, every business will have different calculations for their bond size within this formula. So it is important that you reach out to your customs broker to calculate the monthly totals, and then reach out to a surety agency to help you determine your bond size. Remember that if you, if you use multiple brokers to clear your goods um, when you're importing into Canada, you will need to include all duties and taxes paid to CBSA within that month. So you will need to contact each broker or get the totals for your import imports for every broker that you have. So it's not just one broker. So we started to touch on the topic of bond sufficiency. So let's look just a little bit more into that. Um, bond sufficiency refers to whether or not the bond amount is adequate to protect customs revenue and ensure compliance with applicable law and regulations. Now, in the U.S., when a bond is deemed insufficient, CBP sends a letter to the importer to inform them, and then that importer may not be able to clear goods until an adequate bond is in place. If you would like to learn more about bond sufficiency, um, we do have a full ebook on the subject in regards to U.S. customs bonds. Uh, there's also um, a few educational videos on our YouTube channel as well on that topic. Uh, keep in mind, all of that content was made around the topic of U.S. customs bonds. So again, we're, there's a lot that we're unsure of when it comes to um, how Canada will handle this. So the process might be different, you know. So basically take it with a grain of salt. But if you want to learn more on this topic so you can be prepared, um, I would point you toward those, um, those pieces of content. Now, while it is not clear how they will be handling, um, importers should, or sorry, how Canada will be handling bond sufficiency, um, importers should keep this in mind as they calculate their bond size. That is why we suggest that importers also forecast into the future when determining their bond size. Keep in mind that when you are placing your bond, CBSA is only concerned with the monthly amount you have paid over the past 12 months. However, if you know that you will be importing much more over the next over the course of the next year, it may be a good idea to plan ahead when placing your bond. 
Now take this advice with a grain of salt since you also don't want to be unnecessarily over bonded. However, the fact that CBSA is calculating bond size based on monthly values may make it easier for an importer to quickly have a bond deemed insufficient. With US Customs bonds, the bond amount is calculated based on the total duties, taxes, and fees paid over the course of a 365 day period. So that is an entire year of duties, taxes, and fees. Therefore, becoming insufficient is usually a more gradual process that can we can mostly see coming. In fact, TRG tracks bond sufficiency for our clients very closely so that they can avoid any disturbance in, in their uh, importing process. With a Canadian customs bond, it seems like the bond could be deemed insufficient after one very busy month of importing. So we will have to wait and see how this plays out over the course of the next couple of years. Um, but, you know, if you can be prepared, all the better. Um, you know, at the moment, we're really not sure how this is going to play out. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so here I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Travis to talk you through the current process of placing a Canadian customs bond. Uh, Travis, if you'd like to jump in. Great, thanks Meredith. Yeah, so we know why the bond's required. We know how to calculate the bond amount. And now we're gonna jump into actually getting the bond on file and seeing what the process is like. Next slide, Meredith. So step one, very straightforward and simple, contact a surety agency. Now keep in mind, there are, are countless types of surety bonds out there. There's contract bonds, performance bonds. You want to identify a surety agency or an insurance agency that is familiar with customs bonds and has experience placing these Canadian customs bonds. Um, once you identify that company, reach out to them, give them a call, make sure they pick up the phone and they're receptive and they're, they're pleasant to work with. And Meredith, next slide. That agency, will send you an application to fill out. It'll be a one page form. It's very straightforward, contact information, bond size. They will also collect from your company financials. Now we realize that most of our attendees to this webinar and most companies out there are privately held. So they would rather not send out those financials, but it's important to understand that from the insurance underwriters standpoint, this is a new requirement and they're, they're going to require financials from the minimum bond amount of $25,000 up. Specifically, they're going to want to see 2020 audited financials or full tax returns as well as year-to-date balance sheet and income statement. So be ready to send in that one-page bond application as well as financials. Uh, Meredith, next slide. Once you submit that application and financials to the surety agency, you should hear back within about a day or two with approval. At that point, you will be overnighted the D120 form, the bond form to your office from the surety agency to your office. It's a physical form, it'll come to your office overnighted. Inside the package will be instructions as to where your office signs on the D120 form, as well as the address to send it to next. You'll also have an invoice to pay. Uh, payment will be due upon receipt. These bonds get filed quickly. Well, the, they go into effect when the surety issues the bond. Uh, next slide, please. From your office, the D120 form, the bond copy, will be overnighted to CBSA. Now, as, you, as you're realizing, this is a physical process. There's no online portal to get this done quickly at this point, so it does take some time. Next slide, Meredith. Once CBA, CBSA has received a copy of the bond, they look it over and approve it on their end turnaround time from CBSA is expected to take six to eight weeks. So this is maybe one of the big takeaways from this webinar is that the bond placement, it does take time. And from a service provider standpoint, we really wanna highlight this. 
um, six to eight weeks. So that means that if you if you overnight the the D120 form, the bond copy to CBSA today, it's not you're not going to get it back and approved until April. Now, because this is a new requirement, and as Meredith had mentioned earlier in the presentation, there's 250 to 300,000 companies that will be required to place this bond. You absolutely don't want to be caught in the last wave of companies trying to get this done. Jump on it now, be ahead of it, you know the requirements there, and, and just check it off your list. Next slide. The importer will receive a physical document back from CBSA, stamped approved. So there you go, you got it, you can hang it on your wall, you can file it away, and you can check off the bond and move on to your next project. All right, Meredith, next slide. So the takeaways is we have this requirement in place. If you're gonna be shipping into Canada, you have to have the bond. They've they've put out this, this soft deadline or a hard deadline with no specific date, but spring of 2022. Now spring of 2022 is, is basically now. Um, also placing the bond is not an overnight process. You need to submit the information to the surety agency. The underwriter has to approve it. And then there's a series of sending the D120 form from the surety to you from your office to CBSA. And then that six to eight week time frame for them to finish it on their end. And next slide. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to open up the discussion for some questions. We've already gotten at least a couple. Uh, so remember to submit your questions in the question box of the webinar interface. Now, as those questions start to come in, we're going to go ahead and just do a little bit, talk a little bit more about TRG and then get into those questions. So take this time to submit those questions. So while, while people are typing in those questions, just another quick blurb about TRG. We operate on a unique direct to consumer business model. Often we're able to save our clients time and money. Uh, when available, we're able to provide policies on multi-year billing cycles, which, which can again save you some money and some time. Uh, our bonds, just like any bond secured through any other agency, is valid with any customs broker or freight forwarder. As an insurance agency, we are unique in that we have licensed customs brokers on staff to assist because, again, most of our client base ships internationally and compliance is, is often a part of what our clients ask for. Okay, so uh, let's get into some of those questions. Uh, we do have quite a few coming in. Um, I think Travis is going to help me handle some of these since he's a little bit more familiar with the process of placing these bonds. Um, but Travis, do you want to dive into some first? Yeah, so I see one here. Uh, I'm an existing customer of a U.S. bond. So that might mean you're an existing customer of TRGs. Uh, if financials are... If oh, the financials question, are if current, financials are current, will there need to be, yeah. yeah, will there need to submit new details? Uh, Todd, yeah, we'll have communication with you, and if we have the financials we need on file, just email us and tell us it's okay to use it for the Canadian Customs Bond, and we'll submit those to the underwriter. So that might help your process a bit. Um, can we increase our bond at any time if we get a big import? It's likely that custom that Canadian Customs will not allow an increase to an existing bond. You're going to have to terminate that bond and place a new bond. So that is getting to uh, Meredith's discussion about forecasting out 12 months, trying to anticipate your highest month of importing and placing a bond that'll be sufficient for 12 months. Now, Isabel, we, we know that it, it's hard. You know, there's, there's volatility and nobody can predict the future, but you do the best you can to try to place a bond that will be sufficient for 12 months. 
Yeah. And just to jump in a little bit, this is another thing we don't really know yet, which is, you know, with the customs bond, or sorry, with the US customs bond at TRG, we are very familiar with the fact that this ultimately opens up a lot more liability for you, the importer, and for the surety, which would potentially make you need to place collateral and things like that. We are not sure how this is going to fully work um, with the Canadian customs bond, but we would kind of assume that it's going to be very similar in terms of you know liability for the surety and things like that so just another reason why you know try to prepare as much as you can again i know sometimes you can't you know your business grows and that's great and that's something to celebrate um but you know just try to keep that in mind and you know work with your surety it's, it's good to just have that open line of communication with your surety Okay, and we have some more questions rolling in, and I, I got a good one here, and most people are probably going to have the same question, but I'd like to confirm pricing for minimum or higher. Uh, at the end of the day, the underwriters are going to tell us what the premium is. Uh, I can tell you right now that at that $25,000 bond amount, the minimum bond amount, the total premium with fees comes in at about 500 US dollars. So there you go. You can set your sights there. Um, of course, as the bond amount increases, the premium is going to go up. But at the end of the day, you know, it all boils back to getting that application filled out with company financials and getting it into the underwriter so you get the ball rolling and you can get the exact answer to those types of questions. Um, uh, one question that I'm seeing that I can at okay. least just give a little input on, um, which is what would the role of brokers uh, be in this new scenario? So the role of your broker is is pretty much going to stay the same. They're still going to be able to clear goods for you, um, you know, help you with all of that process. Really, the only thing changing um, in terms of the bond is that you can no longer use their bond. So you need to have your own bond. Now, when it comes to the CARM client portal, this is a big one. Uh, we didn't really touch on it because we're not brokers, so we're not intimately uh, familiar with this, with the you know inner workings of this part. Um, but the CARM, CARM client portal must be set up by the importer, by the business. Um, once the business sets up their portal, they can allow other employees of theirs to access that. They have to go in and set their broker as their broker, basically, as a um, kind of approved party to help with their imports within the CARM client portal. They have to um, give them access, uh, give them authorization. So you must do that part so that your broker can continue basically doing their job. Um, so this is another reason why, you know, you really do want to talk to your broker as well. Uh, the bond is part of the process. Uh, the bond is its own, you know, specific technical thing that TRG specializes in. The broker is going to specialize in that side. So in general, their role is not really going to change other than this bond um, relationship. All right, and we have a question come in. Uh, step one uh, uh, for placing the customs bond is to contact a surety agency. Is this something the importer must do, or is this something that is more easily accomplished with the help of a Canadian customs broker? Great question. Uh, many customs brokers out there will be able to help you secure a bond. They're going to collect the same app, well, a similar application, you know, their version of the application as well as company financials, and they'll provide it to a surety agency, and and they will help facilitate it kind of as a mid, a middleman. So, um, many customs brokers out there will help facilitate that bond. Some customs brokers might not want to get involved with the bond, but if your customs broker does provide the bond and you want to work through them you can definitely go for that. Um, sometimes you can save some money by going directly with the surety agency if you're if you're price sensitive. Yeah, and also just working right. directly with the surety agency is really just going to give you that, you know, additional um, expert to help you through the process. Um, so that's really just kind of the, another added benefit there as well as the support on the bond. Um, I just to kind of go through just a quick question that I saw, which is um, uh, what about GST? Um, is it part of the amounts that needs to be covered by the bond? So GST um, is considered a tax. So from everything that you know I've seen in my research, um, 
the the amount that you're using to calculate your bond size is all of your duties and taxes that have been paid to CBSA in that past 12 month period. So in that definition, that would include GST if that is, you know, it's a tax and it's being paid to um, CBSA. So um, I am not uh, as familiar specifically with some of the uh, aspects of G GST. I can look further into that and maybe give a better answer in the future. But as far as I understand, it's duties and taxes and that would be encompassed in that. Okay, and a great question here from Neil. Small companies in Canada that do not register will not be able to import products. In a nutshell, the answer is yes, that's correct. You know, CBSA isn't um, providing any exclusions for the size of the company. Is if you're importing goods into Canada, you, you got to be you got to be up with this new regulation. So you'd likely qualify for that minimum bond size, but yeah, you need to have the bond. See here, what else do we have? So I, I see a question saying that their current bond client of TRGs, um, how how do our current bond get rec? How does your current bond get recognized? Now I. From what I'm reading in that question, your your current bond client of TRGs, you currently have your U.S. customs bond with TRG. Now, for this new CBSA requirement to get CCP and, and CARM to to, file, to satisfy this requirement, you need to secure a Canadian customs bond. If you're going to be an importer of record for goods going into Canada, the U.S. customs bond will not apply. It's not helpful. Uh, you got to have a Canadian customs bond. So you contact us, reach out, let's get a Canadian customs bond on file for you. Yeah, that's definitely a part of this. You know, I mean, a lot of importers bring goods into the U.S. Um, they also bring goods into Canada. Well, keep in mind, those are obviously two different countries, two different uh, customs agencies. So it is two different bonds. Um, they seemingly are going to function very similarly, but they are two different bonds that you're going to have to place. I got a question here. Does TRG clear into Canada too? Great question. Uh, you know, that gets to the core of what TRG is. We're an insurance agency. We do have licensed customs brokers on staff. That's not to fill a role of clearing entries. That is uh, more from a knowledge base, compliance base, and just to provide service to our clients. Uh, we are not a customs broker, so we do not clear entries into Canada. We can help you secure the bond, we can provide customer service related to the bond, but you'll have to contract with a customs broker to actually clear the entries. The minimum bond, bond side is 25,000, that's correct. Um, so for um, somebody is asking, I'm using FedEx and UPS to ship my goods. Um, don't they uh, handle the customs fees and filings? So uh, Travis, you might be able to kind of add more enlightenment into this. Uh, FedEx and UPS, in essence are a customs broker um so they are helping you clear your goods coming in to us i would assume canada as well um now for smaller importers smaller shipments uh they will charge you kind of more of a flat rate and then you know pay those fees and filings for you um however in some cases you still need your own bond I, that's a little bit more of a case-by-case -case scenario um but, you know, when yeah, it comes so, to... The, so okay. FedEx and UPS, gee, yeah, Meredith, let me jump in. I mean, FedEx, yeah. UPS, they're a customs broker. If you're using them to clear goods into Canada and it's a formal customs entry, you're going to have to have this Canadian bond on file starting spring of 2022. Um, you know, the, the, 
UPS and FedEx will certainly charge you your customs fees and your filing fees, um, but in order for them to be able to clear those entries as of spring 2022, you're going to have to have a bond on file. So they're likely talking to you, telling you to secure a surety bond. I mean, I, I don't see their communication, but I got to think that, guys, a lot of customs brokers and freight forwarders out there that operate to clear goods into Canada are hopefully really pushing this information on you also to have you ready for this because uh, this has been in play for over a year now and we're getting to that final end goal so Suzanne I hope that answers your question um, and uh, if it doesn't reach out to us directly um, but guys I, you know looking over these questions um, I think we've answered just about everything uh, there may be one or two in here that we missed, but we're gonna go through with a fine tooth comb uh, just right after the webinar and we'll be reaching out to you directly. Um, you can also you know, contact us directly. Meredith, you wanna take, take it from here? Uh, yeah, so that is gonna be a wrap on today's webinar. I hope you all you know, enjoyed it and we at least covered, um, covered a good amount, uh, helped answer some of those basic questions. Uh, but yes, thank you for taking the time um, attending our webinar today. If you have any further questions um, after the webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out to either me directly by email at marketing at traderiskguarantee.com. Um, additionally, check out our blog at traderiskguarantee.com slash trgpeak. It's got a treasure trove of excellent articles and information. And don't forget to find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email. Um, usually I send it out the day after, so tomorrow, with links. If there was any links from this presentation, we can provide. Um, I also include the um, the recording of the webinar so that you guys can re-watch. Um, so look out for that uh, in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, thank you again for attending the webinar, and I hope you all have a great a great rest of the week. Thank you.